Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Painted in Color podcast. Painted in Color is a podcast dedicated to fostering a community for and amplifying the voices of underrepresented artists. My name is Lauren Brown, and I am an illustrator living in Austin. And joining with me is... Hi, I'm Mia Araujo, and I'm a self-employed fantasy artist, and I'm based in Orange County, California. Esther? Hi, uh, I'm Esther Wu. I'm a biz dev artist now, ex-concept artist for games, uh, live in LA, but always secretly a New Yorker, East Coast, West Coast. And Eric. Hi, my name is Eric Wilkerson. I'm a sci-fi fantasy illustrator, and I live in the best state in the union, New Jersey. I can't believe you've lied to everybody like that. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that because I'm also from New Jersey. <laughs> What's up, Eric? <laughs> okay, so uh, so I'm 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 starting. So I'm I'm telling you what I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for the past twenty years now, um, I've been working professionally, bouncing back and forth between staff and freelance illustration and concept design for a variety of different companies. Uh, right now, my focus has been more on publishing and doing sci-fi fantasy illustration with a emphasis on Afrofuturism. So that's really what I've been uh, trying to push more in my portfolio. Um, so that's me. Esther. <laughs> so, so concise. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so for me, what do, uh, what do I do? Right now, I'm working in animation. Uh, I actually made the jump quite recently. Um, worked in games for like four or so, four or so years, yeah. Um, but mostly, I just enjoy painting and designing and on the side. Every October, drawing mechs, which is right now. <laughs> What is your drawing challenge called, by the way? Do you have a mech drawing challenge? No, 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 no. It's just, it's just drawing. It's just mechs. 31 days of mechs. That's wonderful. Mechs. Yeah. <laughs> All day, every day. challenge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, That's awesome. Yeah. Mia. So I have a really like, um, different, I guess, path to where I got to today. I actually started uh, in galleries right out of art school because that's what my teachers were actually doing at the time. and. Um, they were uh, showing in galleries around LA, like uh, Rock LaRue Gallery, Copper Nason, uh, Corey Helford Gallery. And um, I actually just started showing there in 2007, um, like galleries like that in 2007 and just kind of all the way up till 2012. Um, and then kind of had a style change or like, you know, a crisis, I guess you would say, where I was like trying to refigure out what, what kind of art I was going to do. And in that process sort of remembered that one of my earliest dreams was to write and illustrate my own stories. So um, that's kind of like what I'm working up to now. Um, I also, uh, in that transition, decided to take a non-art job. So I've been waiting tables and stuff for the last six years and actually stopped because of COVID. And I'm right now full-time doing art and kind of living off savings and stuff. But um, so it's, I'm kind of like in the middle of, of re <laughs> rebuilding an art career. But, um, but yeah, I'm working on my first illustrated novel. So I'm writing and illustrating it. And it's based on uh, Alice in Wonderland and set in a high fantasy West African world um, because I've just been a fan of fantasy for a really long time, but I just am really tired of stories coming from the same part of the world. And I just wanted to make the stories that I wanna see out in the world. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. My name is Lauren Brown, like I said earlier. Um, I'm currently an associate art director working in the games industry and Previously, I was in the animation industry. Me and Esther actually switched places in that regard, which is pretty funny. Um, but I have been doing this for the past four years. But before that, um, in animation, I was also in there for four years. So when I began my career path, um, I had just graduated from SCAD, uh, didn't quite know what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be a character designer. And I stumbled into the world starting as a background artist, uh, working on shows from for FX like Archer, and um and other shows that i won't mention because they were they were not just don't don't look at them um <laughs> but uh afterwards uh, i made the switch to the games industry where i've been working on mainly mobile games but on the side uh at night i do freelance i do 
uh, conventions when we could do conventions, not this year, obviously. And um, I also run an Etsy store. And my art has mainly a focus in um, fantasy, uh, mostly Nouveau themes as well, and a lot of melanin and curvy ladies because that's just what I like to draw. Uh, but you'll see a lot of nature, mushrooms, succulents, and all that kind of stuff in my work, um, just basically as flowy as possible. And um, an example of that is behind me as well. So you're probably wondering what to expect from us for the show. Um, and I'll just start with myself since I'm already here. But what I want to give our viewers is basically a look at how to tackle the illustration industries, the gaming industry, or the animation industry uh, from the perspective of a Black female artist. Because to be frank, there are not many of us in the industry at all. Um, I have often been the only Black woman working in games or animation. and it's quite lonely and I would like to help other people with advice and portfolio reviews and tutorials so that I can start to pave the way for others to make it into the industry to work alongside me because we need to hear your voices and I want to see more of our faces in these studios making these shows, making these games, making these illustrations and doing all the things that we have seen and been inspired for by for years. And that's what I really want to bring to that channel is just um, to give you that advice and guidance so that um, one day you can join me. And I hope you can. Mia, how about you? Um, I actually just want to be really transparent about my my path uh, because I think that you know making trying to make a living as an artist is a really long road and it's really different for everyone and everybody kind of gets it gets into it and succeeds in a very different way and I think we have really narrow uh, like ideas of what success looks like as an artist and I think we all kind of torture ourselves too on what failure means and I grappled with that over the years just um, you know like I didn't I resisted for a very long time. Uh, not focusing on my art in order to make a living like that was such a like a val a thing that I felt like um, you know devalued my art in a way to admit that I couldn't do it you know and so uh, I guess it's just um, just being really upfront about how I've gone about things what my struggles have been and stuff like that just in terms of a different career path but then on the other side of it I think it's really important to create a space for aspiring artists um, from marginalized communities or just whose voices haven't been uh, like welcome at the table and just I want to share all of my knowledge with with these like upcoming artists so that um, to help you because it's it is a really long path and I feel like there's a lot that I've learned and that I wish I had known when I got out of school that I would love to share with you. Esther. Uh, similar yeah and what <laughs> me and Laura I mean uh, I would say that especially after recent um, current events uh, uh, there's a degree of allyship that I've always, um, you know, done as a teen and uh, younger when I had the ability to. Coming from New York City, it, you, I've always been surrounded by more of these events where you're helping out your community, whoever it may be. Um, someone always needs a helping hand. And for me as an artist, I always found it like difficult to to give give back, you know, in a way. So for me, this is, I I want to connect with more people um and i very much want to help especially marginal marginalized um slash bipoc community really come you know into the limelight because i've been in situations where like i become a spokesperson and i'm not a spokesperson uh for anything whether it be because of gender or you know visual looks right the assumptions and I personally want to be able to change that. So for me, for this channel, it's not only just for me to be able to share art knowledge, I want to, you know, do a lot of painting tutorials. Uh, that's my contribution, but also let that be, you know, like a round table where people can also talk to me and reach out um, because I believe in having that open communication because there's a lot of questions. <laughs> there's so, you know, and, and that's the thing too, like, because of where I would say where we all are now, like having worked and having, you know, been in industries, uh, there are things we've experienced that, you know, like when you're, I definitely remember when I'm 20, those, like, how do you navigate really strange, like, social context? Like, that's totally not in my brain. Like, when I was 20, I was like, 
is my concept a good concept? You know, like that's all I'm focused. Like, is my portfolio good? Right. And then you, I would say it's really easy to forget about all the other things that come along with the portfolio. <laughs> um, it's, and it's not just the making of, right. So, you know, for me, this channel is to be able to create more of an open conversation where, you know, maybe some people do have those questions in mind or they're not aware of, or, you know, for me to also, also just be more educated. Like it, this is also an opportunity I find to also educate myself. And that's, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Eric. Uh, well, just basically to uh, uh, dittoing everything that has been said so far, uh, but in addition to uh, speaking about uh, representation, speaking about being a, a Black illustrator, doing something that I love, uh, sharing sharing works in progress, uh, demos and things like that. I think that for me, I would like to get into conversations with uh, all of you and especially uh, any viewers um, more on the emotional, mental aspect uh, of being a artist of really of any kind and in isolation, uh, having to focus on creating and the artistic fears that we all have and how do we overcome that? And how do you suppress and move on? Uh, dealing with imposter syndrome. I was recently speaking to some of my students because I also teach and bringing up the idea, bringing up the, that negative self-talk that pops into all of our heads. You're not good enough. You don't have a style that's good enough. Oh, this person that you were in, in school with is way more successful than you. You'll never make it, blah, 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 blah. All these things that pop into your head. How do you push that down and still be creative? How do you be, how can you make a path for yourself and not be a clone of somebody else. Like a lot of that stuff, it, it swirls in your head. And even once you do make it, there's some part of you that's still whispering in your head, you shouldn't be here. This spot belongs to somebody else. They only gave it to you because. And to fill that push that negative self-talk down with some kind of positive affirmation. Um, I mean, that's, that's the kind of stuff that I, I love to, to listen to. I love to talk about and um, I've needed to, to really put myself into that mind space, that mindset. Uh, and it's the only thing that for a long time got me through uh, trying to chase after a goal of doing Afrofuturism when there really was no market for it outside of fine art or music. Um, and like visual realist Afrofuturism, like I can't name 10 can't name 10 artists and, and it's like man why are you doing that again um are you sure you want to do that you're going to alienate yourself from everybody that would ever hire you like why why are you putting black people in your stuff like all of that floating around in my head constantly and then you won't know you don't know, you won't know what the impact of your art will be until you create it and put it out there. So, and then I know that there are students, I know that there are people out there that have that little self on their shoulder going, you're crap, <laughs> you suck. You should just go play PlayStation because this is a wrap. You can't even draw or whatever, whatever it is that's popping up in your head. But uh, I guess that would be my 
my contribution is just talking about what it is that makes you tick and why you create the art that you create and uh, where you can go with it. So. How to defeat that little toxic voice in your head. Exactly. Awesome. And uh, for subsequent episodes, all of this will be replaced with the bridge of the Enterprise because I'm going to get a green screen. So, yeah. Oh, I thought you were going to get a new computer. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, Eric. I'm sorry. You got to get that new computer, bro. <laughs> it is time. I mean, everybody can look at your, your daughter's wonderful art wall or, you know, they could see the Starship Enterprise. He's not going to buy the Starship Enterprise. He's just going to get a green screen. I'm just gonna well, get a green screen. No, he's going to buy the entirety of the Starship Enterprise. He's going to be inside of the cockpit and it's going to be amazing. I'll just be sitting there like this. <laughs> Captain Kirk. Like, yeah, art stuff. <laughs> Wait, which one are you? So... Kirk or Picard? Or, the, or I don't know the other ones. I haven't watched that much Star Trek. <laughs> I know. I know it hurts. It hurts. <laughs> oh, poor baby. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I have never either. I was Stargate. Oh, Stargate I, I, SG-1? I mean, you watched yeah. one, though. I did watch the original series, Star Trek, though. My roommate was the one who got me into it back in SCAD. Lord. So, I, I mean, watched the original. It was good. Yeah, no, but it's not the same thing. I it's loved all the shenanigans that they got into. Shenanigans? <laughs> what, do you, what else would you call it? <laughs> it's not for shenanigans. You use the word shenanigans when you're like we're talking about the little rascals or <laughs> they got into did you see their acting they got into shenanigans i kind of want to leave this in this is amazing like kirk, kirk rolled around the wall like this one day like it was crazy shenanigans <laughs> was on some other stuff i keep thinking of the gift. lord it was so goofy oh my god it was no, entertaining there's... but it was goofy <laughs> let's there's be real next gen there's there's Voyager, there's Deep Space Nine. If you want to there's, catch content like this, this is when you tune in on Mondays, all right? So just let me like, know right now. There's like <laughs> damn right 800 hours of, of quality storytelling <laughs> there. Quality is a subjective oh. word. <laughs> like i'm not saying hey i'm not saying it wasn't i'm not saying it wasn't good just sometimes it was just campy as all get out so let's be real I you mean, gotta be real with your faves eric come on now we look, gotta be our authentic selves on the show look you're talking about you're talking about something from the, you saw from the 1960s that does not even count if we take if we would remove the 1960s the three seasons of that mess Plus the first two seasons of Next Gen. Everything else after that was gold. Gold. Yeah, but, the, but the original series was gold too, just in a different way. I don't know. It was I, crazy, I, but it was gold. <laughs> it started, it paved the way. I mean, it did. Did it, it did. inspire you more or less than Star Wars? Um... Star Wars was a white man's fantasy. That's true. Star Trek was appropriated. was everybody's fantasy. Yeah. No, so. I mean, star, I mean, I, I, I still remember seeing Return of the Jedi in theaters. And, yeah. Uh, my mom, we sat in like the front row, and my mom, I remember my mom saying how, from credit to credit, I was just like bouncing around in my seat, five years old, like pumped for that movie, but yeah star trek was everything like everything so um you know there's there's stuff i paint to this day that is influenced by trek and i don't tell anybody but i i have the the font for the bajoran uh like ideograms and i still put that like bajoran text in my illustrations no way <laughs> It's oh hidden. my god! Like, but it it says my name in Bajoran, and I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> you're such a nerd. <laughs> I love it. This is great. No, because I am. We all are. That's wonderful. Nobody and actually, nobody knows. So I'm just like, well, I'll let it ride. Shit. I I actually love that, Esther. Like, what was your like first moment where you like you saw something and you were like, this this is everything I want. When was that moment for you? 
I think I think for me it was when I watched a Ghibli film and then I played Final Fantasy VII. Oh yeah, that was I I I played well I I played like my cousin helped me through it because I was it was ninety eight and I was like unable to comprehend the English language yet, but all I remember was he was playing it and I was like games could be in three D what. And then I kept playing more. And then, you know, that's the trek where I went from 7, 9, 10, 12, and then 1 through 6. Um, but it was, yeah, that was that was kind of, for me, the nerdiness. I mean, like, I could, yeah, like, <laughs> Eric's nerding out about things. For me, it's like, it's the music. Like, that's where my nerdiness comes from, where I'm just like, I know what track that is. <laughs> Play that's me a Final impressive. Fantasy track, I will know where it's from. Oh, that's so that's relatable. Impressive. That's really I, awesome. I'm, I'm also like, I can get like, I feel like I can get 80%. <laughs> Maybe not all of it, like most. Yeah, like the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, theme songs for sure. Um, But like, if you want to go like, hello, like fucking obscure and shit, like the dips into the 80 percentile, but I'm pretty confident. The opening of Final Fantasy X, I think, still makes me tear up to this day. Like, when you hear those first opening notes, I'm just like, oh, <laughs> just like the nostalgia is so intense. It's really beautiful. It's just like unforgettable. I love, I love, love, love. Um, is that the one that was, where the, the no, main oh, character's oh, name was like Rain or something? Rain no. Drop, water? No. That was, water I, I believe that was. Yes, it, well, it is. Titus. Titus. Oh, Rain. Oh, I I thought you were talking about the actual character. Isn't there a character in Final Fantasy? Like one of the later ones called Rain or whatever? I thought that was. Maybe I'm lying. But yeah, Titus. There's Sorry. Lightning. That's oh, there 13. is lightning. Yeah. There you go. That's I haven't played all the Final Fantasies, if y'all can't tell. Um, no, 12 was Vaughn, but uh 10 oh. was yeah, 10 was Titus, what you were talking about. Lightning was um 13. Was 13, yeah. I was like 14. Which one had it? the dude with the afro? That was seven. Thirteen. Wait, seven and thirteen. Wait, no, Barrett didn't have an afro. No, he had seven, a Mr. T. Yeah. The, yeah. Seven was Mr. T. Thirteen was Eddie Murphy. <laughs> That's right. He had a little bird in his afro, too. He lived there. It was really cute. Wait, was it voiced by Eddie Murphy? No. He goddamn sounds like it, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's racist it as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's like, seriously. Seriously, so like Dr. Doolittle. Depiction, but Barrett was such a, like, a very like he had an actual character to him but you we don't know that unless you play the game when you see him well that esther's like was, i don't know that dude was straight up a team like like a well, who's that guy again who just oh my god B. baracus mr t i don't know yeah yeah yeah, yeah he was straight up mr t that was bad <laughs> it was see, this bad. is what i haven't played final fantasy so i'm not an authority on this i played a little bit of 10 but never seven i only watched it being played in my best friend's living room i i would say like this is this is like where the nerdiness comes in where it's just like you know if you played it in the 90s you kind of don't realize it but then you just okay analyze like, like we... where it's like we need to clarify we need to clarify something moving forward like the 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 there's a liberal use of the word nerd in this conversation. <laughs> I don't find the word nerd offensive is the thing because no, 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 we it's all are nerds. It's not, it's not that it's offensive to me. It's just, all right, here's here's the thing. Are you saying you're a geek? Are you a geek? Thank you. Oh, wait, what's the difference though? Here we go. And I'll tell you the difference. <laughs> we got another one. Yeah. A geek is somebody that is into some specific part of pop culture. Okay, fair. A nerd is the same thing, but is mathematically inclined. Somebody oh, that that's not... who has a high in intellect over some other area of interest that you could not hold conversation with. Like Neil deGrasse Tyson is a nerd, straight up, he, unapologetic. But he's so cool though. Yes, yes. No, that, but no, that man true, could true. bore you to tears talking about like, light rays and whatnot and you're just like uh-huh fair right Math but could or also science, then? but could but also but could also hold his own in a conversation about star trek that's true so th that's a nerd that's true a dork is the person that knows the difference between the two <laughs> <laughs> and that's you <laughs> 
I actually read that off of a meme. It was like a, oh, it's it was amazing. Like a whole comic strip. And it was like, <laughs> to me. and I was like, wow. It is true. Like, it is true. That's a light bulb moment. So whenever I get the opportunity to share that with somebody, I say, like, hold on a minute. <laughs> let's let's get the uh, the nomenclature right. That's that's totally fair, and I completely agree with you. However, that will not stop me from driving by in a car and yelling to my friend on the street, "Nerd!" Just like that, I'm never going to stop doing that ever. Yeah, because right. just, even if they're not mathematically, inclined. it doesn't sound as it's not as powerful to just go. Gee. Yeah, like nerd has such like a pro- like it, you can project it. It just like has power behind it. It's so yeah. good. Nerd yeah. is just a fun word to say. <laughs> nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Mia, what is your nerd moment? Oh God, I mean, I feel like I'm not as in depth as you all, and I feel really, but but it's like I think definitely the moment for me was the Lord of the Rings movie in like 2000. Was that 2001? I was in high school, and it was like the first time I ever seen anything that blew my mind away. Um, but it was also like it was kind of like the first time I'd seen high fantasy because I actually grew up on like the Chronicles of Prydain books by Lloyd Alexander. Like I don't know if you oh, wow. heard of that, oh, that series. I've never but... heard of it before. Yeah, Disney did a movie called The Black Cauldron, which was a, 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 in the late 80s or something. And apparent, and I was like, oh, this is based on a series of books and the books are way better. But um, but that kind of like was the first, you know, stuff that I got like into reading like a series that was fantasy. And then it kind of primed me for uh, the Lord of the Rings film. And then I think I was reading um, the books around the time that the movie came out, whatever. But I think just the visuals and, and everything, the costumes, everything, I was just completely blown away. And just, it, it started me on wanting to create my own high fantasy worlds. But that was also the time, like right around the time that I started college and started really, you know, um, what is it like, um, just really trying to, well, I think the part of the conundrum too was just like, I was noticing that a lot of these stories all took place either in England or in Celtic, you know, mythologies and stuff. And so I actually felt like I can't do this because I'm not British. And, and then I started asking like, but wait, George R. R. Martin is American and he's kind of doing it, you know, like from this yeah. completely like Celtic world and stuff. But me asking myself that question made me actually question, well, wait, why aren't there like, Latino fantasies or like African fantasy worlds or whatever. And it's like, it's just, I just remember that being the moment where I started really like nerding out about world building was that movie. Um, but I think that I've always kind of had a soft spot for fantasy. Um, and, um, but yeah, like it's like any of those uh, series like uh, Game of Thrones and all that. Like I, I, I'm definitely one of those people that it's like, I can, I know all the characters names and stuff, even the super obscure characters and stuff. I probably couldn't win any contests with like the super fans or anything, but I just, I guess I just really nerd out about world building and stuff like that. But it's definitely more from a fantasy bent. Um, That's such a wonderful thing to, world out, to nerd out about too. Like world yeah. building is just, I can just get lost in it and then I just never make a story because I've world built too much. And yeah. now I'm intimidated by the world that I've made. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'll never do this justice. I shouldn't write anything about it. <laughs> did too because they they were so like when i went back to reread and i mean i know fans will kill me for this but it's like george r, r. martin and like tolkien like went like so into so much detail and it's almost like a history book of their world yeah they, they want to share everything they built and it's like editing <laughs> like you know you don't have to tell all of it yeah but there's no such thing <laughs> what is editing even i understand the, the the uh the need to share it all <laughs> it's hard not to it's just like you're like when you're like a world builder you just compile docs and docs of information and just like all these things it's like oh like and this is like how the religion was formed and this was what these people do that no one will ever see ever and like you just build out all these things and you like realize that you have to distill it down to something that's like legible for other people to understand what's going on yeah and you're like how do i do that like that's well, usually the place where people stop because yeah, they just like they don't know how to Tolkien distill it do that. i guess huh Tolkien didn't do that though. He didn't edit it. He didn't distill it down. He didn't. He just did all of it. It was like Silmarillion, so just like all of it. Hello, just, have this. Walked into a bar, and it's it's not. They don't just say Joe walks into a bar. It's Ray Ray's cousin's best friend's nephew. <laughs> 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 Joe walked into the bar and he's like, I, I don't like, what. Yeah. So I I ended up putting it down. Couldn't. I th- I think the difference between him and most people is that he just didn't get self-conscious about all this information that nobody wanted to see or people did want to see but they didn't know and he just put it in their face and you're like you're gonna look at this now and they were like all right I guess if it's here I'm gonna buy it I like your book mm-hmm. and they did and it's basically just like here's the whole world just have all the lore all the lore oh. but you have to have a certain kind of just like a lack a lack of um of 
fucks <laughs> to uh to just do that yeah absolutely that's what I, that's the energy that i would like to harness one day I don't know that I, I definitely don't write like that. Like I'm creating this world and stuff and I'm definitely editing what I'm giving out because I, I do feel like if I hadn't watched the Lord of the Rings movie at first, like I wouldn't maybe, I probably would have put it down too, but it's like, I was invested because I wanted to know more about this world because visually I was really arrested by it and stuff. But I think that I did remember thinking like, it, feel, it reads like a history book to me from my, and I know again, I'll probably get skewered by, by true fans for calling it that, but it's like, I thought that was fascinating though, that it's like, you could create a history book about a world you made up. Like that's yeah. how you feel about it. And that's how these people, these people kind of feel like they, they lived in this made up world. And I, I found that really intriguing, even though I probably wouldn't want to write that, write that way myself, but just to know that much about your world that you made up is really like, I'm just in awe of that for sure. Yeah. It's always really impressive to me. Yeah. It's like, it's because it's so much effort too, to, to yeah. like, come up with all the mechanics, remember them, and then make it work all together and make it something. Yeah. Like that's so difficult to do. Definitely, yeah. Anyway. That's beautiful. What about you, Yeah. Laura? What is my thing that I nerd out? Well, I have, a, I have a lot of different layers of things that I nerd out about, but I think that the thing that sticks out to me when I was younger, um, it's like twofold because it's both video games and animation, um, but in animation, um, I mean, this is so common, but it's just Sailor Moon. When I watched Sailor Moon and when I saw my first transformation sequence, I was just like, I was just like little, like just tiny on this bed and my eyes are just wide. Like, what is this? Just color and sparkles and dresses and they're changing outfits. And it's like, that's what got me fascinated with animation as a thing. Cause I was just like, wow, like people, somebody did this. Somebody drew all these like, and I didn't know how animation worked back then, but I think that was when I had realized that, you know, like that was a, that was something that people had to do. And, you know, after that, I would just like watch Sailor Moon just so excited and would just twirl around my room and just want to be able to get some of that movement in the art that I would make, just because I just thought it was so beautiful. And, you know, I loved all the characters. I loved that they were just normal girls going through their everyday life but then at night they would just become you know just like any I guess any superhero story really but it was women and I was just like oh I can do that I can fight crime that's so cool I can make stories about people fighting crime and um you know and go to space and you know it's like themed to planets and stuff and so like every person who was a fan of Sailor Moon back in the day would make their own you know themed magical girls or planets or something like that and you know what got me fascinated by categorization in general which is why when Pokemon came out, it was very easy for me to get into that as well. Cause I'm like, oh, it's categorization, but now it's creatures. This is perfect. This is everything I want. Um, Sailor Moon. Hmm? I hate Sailor Moon. You hate Sailor Moon? Why do you hate I Sailor Moon? I hate Sailor Moon. I actually, I, Usagi is the most annoying character. Oh, she's I think very she's, annoying. <laughs> I think she's better in the in the manga but in the anime like <laughs> well, the dub was, was just, also just terrible. Oh, the dub itself was horrific. Oh, I, it was I just was, terrible. I was just like this I was like oh my god this narrative bullshit like <laughs> like fucking these like oh it, it was like it, it it was triggering because it was very like the female focused themes like actually triggered me because there's like an episode or slash chapter where she's like like complaining about like being fat and then die and literally the villain oh yeah I remember like, that episode is like is like what was it they opened up a gym yeah like make you work out until you drop or whatever like they couldn't stop working out was that what it was, was yeah and and i was like a fat kid so i was just oh like, no so i was like really pissed at like these like really tall skinny fashionable high school yeah girls. they were like stick thin i was just like yeah. what are you talking about you're not fat like what is so this I was, yeah i was like this is dumb <laughs> <laughs> is this a girl like and i feel like I was still like maybe a little too young because it, it would it, it, like the way my brain formulated a critique was kind of like as if I had like an older sister and yeah. you know like it made sense to her but to me I'm just like you don't have to be so dramatic about it like you don't have to be so dramatic about a boyfriend you don't have to be so <laughs> dramatic that your like friend likes him you don't have to be so dramatic that like that you're shrieking you're every episode in a yeah. very very high-pitched voice about everything that's ever happened to you yeah, ever and I'm, just like, I'm happy to critique is... sailor moon it was it, when i tried to watch the dub recently <laughs> i was just like how did i ever watch this <laughs> oh this is awful 
<laughs> but actually, if we're talking about another show that I absolutely love that got dubbed to complete garbage was um, Card Captor Sakura. Um, yeah, because that was also one. And basically, anything that Clamp illustrated was just like amazing because like they illustrated, they had frills and just like flowy dresses and uh, like more outfit changes. And their style was so cute. Um, I still remember like in middle school, I drew like a, a huge watercolor painting of Sakura in the red um, in the red outfit. But the dub, like I watched the entire anime recently, the actual real version on, um, was it on Netflix? Netflix? I think it was on Netflix. It yeah. Was Netflix. Yeah. And they, they edited out so much of the content that made the show, you know, just like special. Mm -hmm. And also the show is really problematic in a lot of different ways too. There's a lot of weird age different relationships, which I was just like, what is going on? Why is this little girl in love with her teacher? That's so weird. weird. Too. That's no, Sailor yeah, Sailor Moon 2 was also like that, but Card Captor Sakura was just like really egregious about it. Um, I but... think I think it was better though because it... it actually portrayed it in a very like this is high school girl like middle school school girls kind of go through it, and then there's more characters that show different types of death. I don't know. That's I don't know. Me. There was they were in like an elementary school though. Like there was like a little girl who was like bringing gifts to her adult school. man teacher. No, they I were in they elementary. Sakura bad. was like in fourth grade. <laughs> she was real young. But I'm happy. I take that back. Yeah, but anyway, my faves are problematic. Anyway. Um, I think all our faves are probably problematic. To some probably, definitely, to some degree, for sure. Um, but the thing that the American version completely took out of it was a lot of the, there were um, LGBT, LGBT themes in that show. And like the main, the boy Lee, was in love with um you know like one of the the characters that was you know again a lot older but high school student and like a lot of the plot in the early episodes were about just like how much you know he was just like in love and like him and the main character were competing for you know they're like oh we are we're you know rivals now in love but it was they were so accepting of it they were just like oh like you have a crush on him too oh like let's talk about it like it was just it wasn't even a thing yeah. and I love how normalized that was, even though, you know, it was a child, like, who had a crush on the high school student, but still, like, the fact that they were just so open about it was really nice to see, and I was like, oh, they cut all of that stuff out, like, you know, in, um, American TV yeah. couldn't really handle that, like, they, I mean, we've, we've evolved a lot, because there's a lot of, um, of shows that actually, you know, embrace openly those themes, and I'm really happy to see that, because, there was like, I mean, Sailor Moon was a great example of that, you know, they're cousins <laughs> when really they were just definitely in a relationship. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, just like really just the design of that show and just the magic and wonder that I felt uh, when I was watching those shows was, you know, kind of like why, I mean, I was always in art, but like why I got into specifically what I like to draw now, you know, like magical, like ladies and witches and, you know, just like intertying different themes with costumes and all that stuff. And yeah, it's just, you know, <laughs> looking back at it, it's like, wow, like, I can't believe I absorbed so much terrible content, but I don't regret it. It was great. <laughs> when you're kids, you could just deal with anything, but I'm just glad that things have gotten better over the years, for sure. So, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's where I came from in a nutshell. It also explains a lot about me, too. <laughs> <laughs> If you're wondering when to catch Paint in Color, we will be airing every other Monday at 10 a.m. PST and 1 p.m. EST. You can catch interviews, um, art tutorials, uh, roundtables, and more on this channel. So please, if you want to tune in, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button to stay up to date on all the things that we're going to be planning for you in the future. <laughs>